being subjugated to another. Well, there's a medieval philosopher, Thomas Aquinas, if anybody knows who St. Thomas Aquinas, 1200s. So he was a theologian, philosopher, and he has this line. Um, he said, injustice can occur in two ways. It can occur by the violent act of the man who possesses power, right? like the, the, the tyrant. And it can occur by the false prudence of the sage. Okay, The false prudence of the sage. So that means, I'll talk about this in a second, what I mean by prudence. Uh, but that means by the, an error in thinking of the supposedly wise guy, the charitable giver, the policy maker, that actually, if we don't have prudence, which I'll talk about in a second, and see things like correctly, we can actually create injustice. Okay, we can actually create injustice. So let me, I'll talk for just a little bit, and then we can have some Q&A if you want. Unless you're tired, then you can go home. All right, so, um, so the, there's a couple things that are at the driving, and then I want you, I, I, you need to remind me of two things. Okay, what's your name, sir? Wait. Quinn, Quinn, you need to remind me of one thing and Alexa one thing. Okay, Quinn, you're going to remind me of urban renewal. Got it? And you're going to remind me about prudence. Okay? All right. So the driving force of this film, right, the underlying kind of vision of the film, is really that the deepest problems with the way that we've helped uh, address poverty throughout the developing world over the last decades. Um, they are manifested in the things you saw, from solar panels to orphans to large-scale foreign aid to rice subsidies, right? Um, but that the, that the problems aren't generally or fundamentally policy problems, okay? The fundamental problems are actually philosophical problems, and they're and also theological problems, okay, which I'll get to. So the fundamental problem is that we have treated poor people like objects. We treat poor people like they are objects. Objects of our charity, objects of our pity, objects of our compassion, or objects of our social engineering. We're going to, you know, go in and solve the problem by kind of mechanized solution to the problems of poverty. Okay? And so the first, so the first fundamental problem is we have treated people like objects. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The second, I would argue, is that we have replaced charity with humanitarianism. Okay, we've replaced charity, which comes from the Latin word caritas, right, which means love. We've replaced caritas, charity, with humanitarianism. And I'll talk about what that means. So charity has to do with love. Now love, right, the definition of love, does anyone give me a definition of love? It's a feeling that you feel when you feel feelings. <laughs> Love. Okay, anybody want to give me a better definition than I just gave? That was a good definition. You've all felt that feeling? Okay. Anybody want to give me a definition of love? Anybody? What? Are you in love? <laughs> I'm in love. I mean, I'm in love. So the definition of love? Yeah, what do you think? Like, um, Showing care. Showing care. Okay, anybody else? Good. I think that's right. Partially right. Anybody else? No one's in love? Compassion. What? Compassion. 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 Like, compassion comes with, like, suffering with. So I think that would be part of love, right? Okay, so let me give you a definition of love. You can work, we can work with it. All right? Um, this is an ancient definition of love. To love, okay, is to seek the good of the other. Okay, to love is to seek the good of the other. So it is to have an intentional desire for the benevolence of another person. In Latin, that's the intentio benevolentia. An intentional desire for the benevolence of the other person. One of my favorite philosophers, Joseph Pieper, he's passed away, he died in the 90s, um, has another explanation of love that I think is very powerful. To say I love you is to say it is good that you are. It is an affirmation of being. It is good that you are. So to love is the intentional desire for the benevolence of the other person. It is to seek the good of the other. Okay, To will the other person's good. So sometimes you might hear in the Christian tradition, 
Love is an act of the will. Have you ever heard that? Love is an act of the will. And that's like the most boring description of love, right? If you think, if you, if you, if you stop there. Love is an act of the will. Like, so, I came home to my wife. I was like, against my wishes, I love you. It's an act of my will, even though I don't want to. Right? That would not be very, uh, I think, compelling to her, right? If I said that to her, right? So, we can oftentimes think of the act of the will as like, you know, you got to run another lap around to train for your soccer match. So just make an act of the will. Right? You can say, all right, come on, 10 more push-ups, make an act of the will. Get two more sets out, act of the will. I love you. All right? Okay, so we can think of act of the will that way. That's not what act of the will means. It means that you have fully consented with your will. So it goes through your intellect with your with, in your will, and you fully consent that I seek your good with an act of the will. Okay, so that's what love is. So we've taken love, which is to seek the good of the other. And that means I want your flourishing. I want your success. I want your independence. Okay? I want you to, to be something. I want you to do something with yourself. Right? So, for example, if I love you, that could mean that I might be difficult with you. I don't mean difficult with you like beating you up. But I might be like, no, you got to get more done. Why? What's your name, sir? Luis. I'm like, Luis, you're not living up to your potential. Okay? Let's go, Luis. You're not living up to your potential. Are you? You're not, are you? Me too. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay, we can do it together. All right. So we're not living. So if I say, Luis, come on, you can do better. You're getting a C minus in this class. I want you to get a B plus. Let's go. Get the work done. Okay? Come on, Luis. You got to run faster. Let's go. You're lagging. Okay? Right? This could be because I want him to flourish, okay? So, so the, the love is the seeking of the good of the other, it's willing the other person's good, it's wanting them to flourish as a human being. Humanitarianism is a really limited horizon. It kind of stops here. It just focuses on providing physical comfort. The dominant view of humanitarianism is to provide physical comfort. And this goes back to Alexa. Alexa's point of, Actually, we can do harm. Why? Because if all I'm focused on is your physical comfort, Luis, you got a game tomorrow? Let's go. We're going to make it happen. Here's a jelly donut. <laughs> okay, I am not like, the, the coach is like, don't give him a jelly donut. Okay, he had three of them this morning. Okay, so <laughs> giving, giving Luis extra jelly donuts because I just want him to feel comfortable before the game. Have some jelly donuts. It's going to be fine. Right, I'm not willing his good. I'm only providing his comfort. Okay, now these are silly examples, but now think about it in the context of the film. Humanitarianism, we provide food, shelter, etc., but we destroy your ability to work, build a business, and take care of your family. Right? And so, like, one of the people in the film said, like, imagine if you have children you can't take care of. It's like, don't worry, I'll take care of them for you. Well, like, well, I don't want you to take care of my children. I just need a job. Right? And so humanitarianism became the dominant model of how we think about caring for the poor. Now, this is like a philosophically historical interesting thing, right? So I'm not going to bore you with all of it. But I want you to think about this just quickly. Humanitarianism is a secular, hollowed out version of Christian love. So Christian love, like if you think of like the letter of James, right? Or you think of the idea like, if someone's in need, what do you do? You care for the person in need, all right? And so the Christian understanding of love that really transformed the ancient world, the development of hospitals and all these things that come out of the Christian understanding, they're going to care for the person in need. That gets hollowed out and secularized. So we're no longer thinking about your flourishing, and we're no longer thinking about your eternal destiny, that you have, a, that God has a plan for you. Like, no, that stuff, we don't pay attention to that because we're just focused on the secular. And then material, so now love becomes humanitarianism, and I just give you things to address your comfort. So notice that that's not simply like a public policy, like, well, House Resolution 461, we could just do this. Yes, but if we think like humanitarians, instead of thinking like we're doing actual charity, we can do injustice to poor people by giving them stuff that actually keeps them down. 
Okay? So, so that's the first is that the human person is a subject. The second is that humanitarianism has replaced charity. And the third one is that we have adopted an idea of social engineering. And they're connected, okay? They're connected. Um, actually, so what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, before I talk about social engineering, what's your name? Toby. Toby, you have to remind me about social engineering. This is so good that I don't need notes. It's perfect. Okay. All right. Before I talk about social engineering, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of a subject. Okay? The person as a subject and not an object. So, actually, Dr. Turner said this is one of my... So, one time I was talking to these um, high school girls. They were friends with my, my, uh, one of my daughters. I have seven children. One of my daughters is a high school girl. And I was... I saw all of her friends. I said, how are the girly pops? Oh my gosh. Okay. And one of the girls was funny. She said, she said, I said, oh, I was saying, oh, you tell this thing. She goes, well, I did it because I had to work on my social anxiety. I'm like, you don't have social anxiety. What are you talking about? She's like an amazing singer and dancer. I've seen her. She's like, she goes, yeah, like, no, you don't. Sometimes you get nervous. That's not social anxiety. Give me a break. Social anxiety. I've seen you. I've seen you sing. I've seen you talk to people. Sometimes you feel awkward, like everybody. I mean, 8 billion people sometimes feel awkward, right? All of us do. Sometimes we're like, is that a social anxiety? So anyway, I've given her this talk, which I won't give you, but you don't have social anxiety. You're just awkward. Maybe one, one of you might be this, okay? Mm -hmm. But most of you, you're just, you just feel nervous every once in a while. There might be one or two of you who are a little bit more than the others. But generally speaking, but she said to me, I mean, you may be, okay? But most likely, we're just kind of nervous in front of so she said to me, wait, because you're, you're saying, if I say I have social anxiety, then I, then, I'm, then I just define myself as socially anxious. Instead of saying, well, I'm a person who can do a lot of different things, but, and sometimes I get nervous in front of other people. I said, yes. See the difference? One's a radical difference. Anyway, so my daughter said, oh, she's, she's getting the Michael Miller starter pack. Okay. So I have Michael Miller starter packs. So I'm going to give you one of my Michael Miller starter packs. Are you ready? Okay. Michael Miller starter pack on the Michael Matheson Miller double starter pack feature on what is the difference between a subject and object and why it matters. Okay. Human beings are not objects. We are subjects. Okay. What does that mean? So philosophically, let's think about this for a second. I have this phone. And I look at it. And it's an object of my my eyes, I see it. Okay, it's something I have. Right? And now I look at you. What's your name, sir? Gaba. Gaba. I look at Gaba, and now see, just like look at the phone. Gaba. Right? Object. Object. Objects of my vision. Right. So in grammar, the object. He's the direct object. Right. Or the indirect object. Okay. <coughs> so in one sense, we're all objects for each other, moving around. And there's lots of objects in this room. But then something about each and every one of us in the room stands out among all the other objects that you see. And there's lots of objects in this room. And yet, when you see another person, something stands out. Why? Because the person is not simply an object, but also a subject. That is, think of it grammatically. They are another I. I go, I eat, right? You're another I. So, you're, each of us is a subject. All right, so what does this mean? That means, and how we know this because we're, and I can go more into it, but we're, we, we have the ability for intersubjective relation. I can know something about God, and he can know something about me. We can have, a commu we can have communication, right? He is an agent with self-determination. Now, what's your name, sir? Jose. Jose. So let's say I go like this. Throw this over here. And then I go, Jose, move. And I move, Jose. Okay. You would think, well, that's weird he threw his phone. But you would kind of be almost horrified <laughs> if I just picked up Jose and moved him over here. Okay? Because I can't treat Jose the way I can treat his phone or his backpack. Even if I took Jose's phone and I was like, boom. You would think, wow, this guy is unbelievable. He's a jerk. He's ruined Jose's property. But now I pick up Jose and I move him and the whole world has changed. Okay? Because what you see is Jose is not simply an object. He's a subject, just like you are. Okay? Now, you all read the Bible? Okay. Genesis. 
here's an example of how to think about objects and subjects. So in Genesis, remember, Adam creates, sorry, God creates Adam, okay? God creates Adam, and he puts Adam in front of all the animals. And Adam names the animals. Remember this part? Okay? He names the animals. And what does he feel? unsatisfied. He's unsatisfied. Alright? So God puts him in a deep sleep. And out of his rib, he creates Eve. And he places Eve in front of Adam. Do you remember what Adam said? Do you have professors who tell bad jokes? No. I don't tell bad jokes. No, not at all. Okay, I only tell good jokes. Not, not, not at all. Why are they looking at you? Okay, listen, if I were a professor who told bad jokes, this is the joke I would tell, but I don't tell bad jokes. Okay, I don't tell good jokes. In my house, if you tell a joke that's not funny, you get in trouble. I'm just kidding. All right. Okay, but this is, about, if, this is what Adams, he looked, this is why the woman's called woman, because he looked at her and he's like, oh, man. Okay? Oh, that's a bad joke. <laughs> I did not tell that joke. I, like I don't tell bad jokes, okay? <laughs> All right, now, <laughs> he's looking at me like, I like it. All right. Think. Okay, you like it? Yeah. Oh, man. You see, it's a terrible. I didn't make that joke up. Because I don't make up bad jokes. I heard that joke. Okay. All right. Back to this. Do you remember what? Don't you get it? You get it? It took a while. Okay. You guys are tired. You're like, oh, man. Oh. Oh. No, I got it the first time. You got it the first time. Okay. So I'm like, oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. All right. All right. Back to this. Okay. But seriously, what does Adam say? He looks and he says, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. At last. Now, Benjol Scola in his book, The Nuptial Mystery, says, what Adam sees when he sees Eve is he sees identity. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Identity. And he sees difference. Woman. Identity and difference. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And difference. Woman. And in that call, difference is a call to communion. Right? The two become one flesh, the Bible says. And out of that call to communion comes uh, another subject, willed for his or her own sake. This is why it's very important. A child does not belong to the parents. A child is not the property of the parents. Okay? The parents have authority over the child. They have responsibility over the child. Okay? But they don't own the child. Because each person is a subject, will for his or her own sake. All right? So when you say a child is a gift, that's actually an ontological reality. It's not a sentiment, like you feel feelings. But that's true. A child is a gift because a child is given to the parents as a gift that they don't own. They're not. They just have stewardship of it. Right? Now we go back to love. What do you want to do with the child? You want to love the child, which means you want the child to be to flourish and succeed, to be all that they can be, as the arms is. Okay, right? So this is what love, so notice the love. So now you have the gift. Now, this relationship, in Adam and Eve, you see identity and difference. And what you have is intersubjectivity. Two subjects in intersubjectivity. So it's actually really deep, okay? Because, uh, what's your name, ma'am? Cameron. Cameron? Okay. So Cameron and I are looking at each other, and we're having a conversation, okay? Now, what happens if I, if there's a painting up here, and I go sit next to Cameron? I can now see what Cameron sees. If she comes over here, she can see what I see. Oh, oh I see what you see, okay? Intersubjectivity. You follow me? Okay? So you're both subjects and also subjects. Okay, you're all following? All right, so, but then the fall happens. The fall happens. And we often think of, oh, okay, you're going to have to work, sweat of your brow, so, so think of this. Right. There's another thing that's said, I think maybe the saddest thing in the whole Bible. God says to Eve, you shall desire your husband, and he will lord it over you. You shall desire your husband, and he will lord it over you. And there's a lot of complex readings, church fathers, a lot of things you can but one of the things that Skola explains that I think is very powerful is when, when the fall happens, 
the difference, that is woman, comes in front of the identity, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And Adam turns Eve into an object, an object for his use, and Eve vice versa. And so there's a struggle that comes up. Okay. And this is what we can do to poor people, people of a different ethnicity or race or country. We see, oh, the poverty comes in front of their identity. And that's why Theodore Dalrymple said, how oh, they're somehow different from us. He was the guy with the green sweater. They're somehow different from us. Right. Well, yeah, because we've let the difference cover the identity. And so that's what I mean by object. We, we turn them into objects. They're objects of our manipulation, of our compassion. Right? They're objects of our pity. The poor thing here. But in that here, we can actually do injustice. All right? So the first, that's the dominant view, is that each human being is a subject. Now, I do have good news. Okay, remember I told you Adam and Eve said, you know, it's terrible and they lord over you. Okay, so in the Christian tradition, there's a definition of marriage. That is, marriage is a one of the things. It's not the definition of marriage. It's a, one of the descriptions of marriage. Marriage is many things. But one of them is marriage acts as a remedy for concupiscence. Does anybody know what concupiscence is? Concupiscence is, you know, okay, you know when St. Paul says, I do what I hate and I don't do what I want. You know what I'm talking about? He says, I do what I hate and I don't do what I want. Okay. Have you ever thought, like, okay, today I'm going to do, like, okay, I'm going to be good. You know, I'm not going to do this thing. I'm like, have it. I have it. I'm not going to, all right, I'm not going to talk bad about, you know, Susie. All right. I'm like, I know I shouldn't talk bad about Susie. I've been feeling kind of guilty talking bad about Susie. I'm like, you know, Susie did. Oh, man, she tried to be great. Ah, I'm blowing. Okay. You do what you hate, you don't do what you want. You come up, you're gonna, you're gonna, you want to do the right thing and you make a mistake. Okay? And that tension of that is really concupiscence. It's this struggle that we have. That doing good is hard. Putting down the jelly donuts and going for the run is hard. Right? This is this sense of like disintegration and concupiscence. And so in marriage, in male-female relationships, well, in all relationships, but especially the heightened in male-female relationships, you're a Hebrew scholar, aren't you? Greek and Hebrew, yeah. Greek and Hebrew. So a friend of mine who's an Orthodox Jew says, it's very interesting, if you take the Isha and Isha, man and woman, and if you take the, the, the one of the letters out, which is the first letter for God, man and woman become fire. And if you put God in, it's like he gets healed. So it's very interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. It's in the Hebrew already. So what happens? It's a remedy for concupiscence. So what that means is, in marriage, the self-donative love of mutual submission Right? Like the Bible says, of giving and taking, like the Bible says, takes the identity and difference and puts them back together so that you become an intersubjective relationship. So the point that we have objectification doesn't mean we always have to have objectification, right? There's grace that enables this to take place. But what's happened is we have now turned the dominant model of almost all of our poverty People are objects. All we need to do is provide for their comfort. And I guess what? I got a plan. Number three, social engineering. We're going to just engineer them because we've won World War II, and now we're going to win the peace, and we're going we're to organize people. And we didn't just do it through foreign aid. We did it through uh, urban, renewal. urban renewal. Okay, so in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we went into large <laughs> cities with a plan, and we looked at all these neighborhoods. 48% of them were African-American, African -American, but there's many ethnicities, Latinos, there were Irish and Poles and Catholics and Italians and all these different people. And we went into these neighborhoods, and they were kind of slum-like, and they were like, oh, these aren't very nice neighborhoods. And so we cleared the slums, and we put these beautiful parks and put these massive, huge buildings. And we took the people and said, now you can live in the huge building. Well, what we didn't see was... Those weren't just slums of tenements. They were neighborhoods with families and businesses and private properties and rentals. In one working class town in, in, in a section of Detroit called Pole Town, it was called Pole Town because a lot of Poles lived there, but it was actually multi-ethnic. Ethnic. Um, there, were, well, there was one hospital, six churches, 150 businesses, 1,300 homes, and 4,200 people, and it was all cleared out so we could put a factory. 
So we actually did the similar thing to the, in the United States. A African American places like Black Bottom had African Americans at higher marriage rates than white Americans. They owned businesses, they owned land, they had property. We cleared those places out, we put them in projects, and we said, oh, in order to get public housing, you can't have the uh, be married. So if you if the father of your children comes and lives with you, or you get married and you live with your husband, you lose public housing. And if you save too much money, you lose public housing. And if you make too much money, you lose your welfare benefit. And so we created, through social engineering, we destroyed the natural communities, including families, where people flourish. So it's not just in the developing world. It's right here in the United States. We've been doing this for a long time because we've treated people like objects. We don't think about love. We think about just providing comfort, physical comfort, and we socially engineer them because, and this is too deep to get into, but because we have limited our view of reason, all we do is think that unless you can measure it, it doesn't matter. So beauty, goodness, hope, friendship, truth, justice, compassion, love, mercy, all of those things are outside the realm of the planner. The planner is just focusing on what can be measured. Okay? And there's deep, deep disorder there, which I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you work hard for like 40 seconds, okay? The dominant view of rationality, of reason, is unless you can empirically prove it to me, Unless you can demonstrate it empirically through measurement, I won't believe it. Okay. I won't believe it. It has to be proven to me empirically in order for it to be reasonable. But well, there's two huge problems with that. Number one is, guess what? You can't prove that statement empirically. It doesn't make any sense. It's incoherent. How could you prove that statement with measurements? It's just an assertion of the will. And second, as I said, it takes the most fundamental human things, justice, truth, right, wrong, beauty, goodness, friendship, pushes it outside the realm of reason. And so now it's just about power and efficiency. And so the biggest problems with the poverty industry are not policies, although those absolutely matter. The biggest problems are treat people like objects, We've lost charity and replaced it with humanitarianism and providing them material comfort, which oftentimes, as Alexa points out, makes people worse. And then we socially engineer them and don't pay attention to all the beautiful order and relationships that are going on because we can't see it. And this goes back to the statement, the false prudence of the sage. Okay? So prudence, do you know what the classical virtues are? Yes? There are four cardinal virtues. You know what they are? Anybody remember that from like Philosophy 101? Okay. So in the tradition, Greek, Roman, Christian, there are four cardinal virtues. And they're called cardinal because they're like the hinge. See how the doors have hinges? These are the hinges of the moral life, hinges of virtue. Okay. Okay. That's why they're called the four. They're, 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 that's why they're called cardinal, because they're, they're the hinge. And there are four of them. Justice, temperance, Courage and prudence, okay? Justice, giving each other what's due. Temperance, being moderation, especially in your intake of drink and, and food. Courage, right? Standing up for injustice in the face of fear and protecting the innocent. And prudence. Now, prudence we usually think of as being careful. We think of prudence as being careful. That's not what prudence means. Okay, prudence doesn't just mean being careful. Okay? Prudence means seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly. And that's why prudence is the mother of the virtues. Right? The greatest virtue. Amazing. The great, great virtue. I love virtue. Okay. Um, I can never, I've always wanted to be able to impress, I can do all the other presidents except President Obama. I just can't get him. It's kind of like prudence. Prince of Virtue. I just can't get it. There's something about Trump that can really reach you. Okay, I can get it. I can like, uh, oh, yeah. man. you were too young to remember. <coughs> okay, because you were not here when I was president. Okay, those were good days. All right, but anyway, all right. So,
Prudence is the mother of virtues because prudence is seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly. Uh, right? And that is that in order for us to be just or charitable or kind or merciful, we have to see the world as it is and act accordingly. And if we get who the person is wrong, what charity is wrong, and what society and how it can be planned wrong, we're going to create lots of injustice for poor people. And that's what the poverty industry has done. We have created injustice for poor people. Like DeSoto says, they are, the legal systems are simply unfriendly to poor people. And they're unfriendly to poor people here in the United States, too. All right? So that's the driving vision of poverty cure, and that what people really need is not stuff. They need access to the institutions of justice. And that's why we talked about clear title to land, the ability to start your business, and all the other things that all of us here take for granted, okay? But if, if you're from, say, many parts of Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, there's no clear title to land. You can't start your business, right? And so the whole goal of this is to actually think about this question. And this is a film for general audiences, but it goes back to the golden rule, right? To treat others the way we want to be treated. And what we want to be treated is we want actually someone to help us when we're in need to get us to be independent so we can help others. But too often our poverty work has done exactly what Alexis said, that we have actually created harm, all right? So that's my summary of the, the, the philosophical and theological questions of behind that film, all right? So anybody have any questions, comments, arguments? I like arguments. Jose, did you tired? You just played soccer, you like got up early to go to bed. <laughs> Quinn, if you did I get it right? Yes. Okay. Uh, to try and prevent uh, it from becoming a. In many ways, they say it's uh, for non profit, but as uh, shown, uh, many people do, in fact, profit. Uh, what type of uh, restrictions and regulations do you think would probably help uh, reduce the impact negatively that it has on communities? That's a good question. I mean, I think, like, it's very difficult to, I mean, I think the best ways to think about regulations is you need clear rule of law, okay? And you need, you need, um, I think the issue of regulation is going to be very difficult because what you're going to ask then is for here's what's going to generally happen with regulation okay regulation is always you're always going to need some regulation okay but most important is you need rule of law you need clear rules here's what happens with regulation oftentimes <clears throat> regulators write rules and they go to big organizations to get advice on how to write the rules okay so this happens with business all the time in the United States okay who do you think writes Agricultural USDA rules. Regulators in the government influenced by large big pharma. I'm sorry, big agriculture. Who do you think writes the drug regulations? The FDA influenced by massive pharmaceutical companies. Okay? So when people, when people, like poor people and small businesses, they don't have the social and political context to navigate the system that's dominated by big business and powerful bureaucratic interests, like the alliance of state and business. Okay? So there's a farmer named Joel Falson who you saw in that, he's the farmer guy you know, from Virginia. He wrote a book called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Right, it's a great book. He, it's called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Why? Because the USDA has so many rules that he can't actually farm. They, right? So I'd say what the better way is to kind of create spaces for people to build businesses for people, and then for charities, as if they're decentralized and local, then they're able to kind of address them. Now, you need rules for fraud and for you know for misuse of money, um, but the big thing I think would be to say for donors to those nonprofits and for others to say, okay, let's stop thinking about this top-down distribution and let's start thinking about how we're actually impacting the com the, the country, the place, the city, or whatever it might be. Um, so you need rule to, rule of law for sure. But regulation sometimes will just get dominated by the largest, most powerful NGOs, and they'll end up um, kind of creating a system to benefit themselves. Uh, Follow-up question into that, because uh, I remember growing up and 
seen many commercials of a dollar a day will feed this starving African child. Uh, your average person doesn't see the bigger picture of how it can negatively impact those kind of communities. How can we go ahead and share with uh, your average person uh, on the realistic impacts that this these kind of activities have? Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons we made the film, right? It's a good question. This is why we made the film, is to be able to show that. Uh, I'll tell you this. I mean, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Right? Everybody, you can say, okay. Remember the beginning of the film? What was the being critiqued? Do you remember? There was a song being critiqued. The Christmas song. The Christmas song. Okay, what's your attitude of that Christmas song right now? What do you think about that Christmas song? What? It was rude. It was rude. Anybody else? All right, now here's what's interesting. And this goes to your question, so I'm answering them. Okay. So, one is you just have to make arguments. And you have to make them with charity. And you <coughs> just have to make them, you have to make them creatively. Okay, look at me. I'm a bald, middle-aged man. Okay? <laughs> okay? I'm also awesome, but that's, that's obvious. <laughs> okay, so I'm a bald, middle-aged man. Okay? And I'm going to come up in front of you guys. And you're going to hear like, Be the world. Okay? And I'm the bald middle-aged man's gonna come up. Look at these glasses. I mean, this like says like, thank you very much. You're old, okay? And I'm gonna walk up and I'm gonna say, you're not though. Okay, all right, see we have the same glasses. Okay, here we go. So you, oh my goodness, I'm so fashionable. All right, here we go. So if I come up here as a bald middle-aged man and I'm like, do you know that song about the Christmas thing by all those stars, a bunch of dumb stars? The music's too loud in here anyway, isn't it, right? No one is going to listen to me because I'm just a curmudgeon who happens also to be right that this song <laughs> is totally rude. Okay? I had heard that song in high school and I thought, this is the stupidest song. Okay? Yeah. In my 40s, I stabbed it. <laughs> you just saw it. It was great. It brought such joy to my heart. Okay? But how did we do it? Right? We did it by, this is one of the reasons we made the movie, is you have to, you have to make the positive case. You have to show what, what the situation is, right? If you say, you know, giving a dollar a day to a bunch of poor Africans isn't going to help anybody, right? That's, like, not going to win, right? You're just, like, you're just a, a selfish American who hates foreigners, okay? Like, not going to win, right? You have to make the case of what, why it's wrong. Do you understand? If I say... Rock and roll music doesn't help feed Africans. Well, of course you think that. You're a bald middle-aged man. Of course. Like, why? That's what you're supposed to think. So you see, I have no theory or credibility. But when you see the film and you see Magat Wade, that's her name, Magat Wade, all right? She says, we, we, you think we don't even know when it's Christmas? I mean, this song is so stupid, okay? And you realize... Okay, you turn the question. So the key, I think, to that, the reason I gave you that long answer is, remember, in any discussion you're having, what you're trying to do is get to the, the fundamental question of truth. So you're not trying to win the argument. You're trying to get the question of truth. And so to say someone about this dollar a day, say, you know, in some cases, this is what I'm saying, in some cases in an emergency, giving someone help really matters, right? So we just had the hurricane in North Carolina, Florida, um, you see there's an emergency. Aid is very helpful in an emergency. But what actually happens, and I have a lot of data to show you, et cetera, et cetera, is when we try to do it in a sustained manner, it actually ends up crowding out businesses. Um, and then you can tell stories, tell stories that you saw in the film. Oh, do you know what I learned the other day? Uh, this thing here. And then people say, oh, I never thought of that before. Right? And so people, I think, generally who are charitable and willing to give, they actually do want to give well, right? And then it goes to the question of, like, what poor, poor people need is not stuff, right? Only in an emergency. What people in developing countries need, poor people need, is they need access to the institutions of justice so they can create prosperity in their own families and their own communities, just like we do. And that's why Herman Chinnery Hesse, the good an entrepreneur, said, tell me one country that's ever gotten rich off foreign aid. If you know, let me know, mm -hmm. okay? And so... The, those are the ways that you're, you have to like show, you, you, 
you have to show in a positive manner that you're not just a curmudgeon who doesn't want to give your dollar away. Okay? You're not just a middle-aged ball. Well, <laughs> I am a middle-aged ball man, but not who just like doesn't like music because it's dumb. Right? But actually says, well, actually, this song perpetuates an image of Africans that's 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 unfair. Right? And that's how you make the Lord. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you for coming. Yes, sir. We have a question for you. Yes, sir. If you're awesome because you're a bald middle-aged guy with glasses, yeah. does that make me the same way? No. <laughs> I was thinking about that. And number one, your hair is way, way too long. Okay? I mean, that's like a hippie. Okay? You know what I mean? Like, this hair is short. Um, no, I'm just teasing. Yes, you're awesome, too. All right. No, uh, just teasing. All right, good. Thank you very much for coming. And